And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Egyptian newspaper El Watan reported that a group of Egyptian lawyers have filed criminal terrorism charges in the International Criminal Court against Barack Obama and his half-brother Malik Obama. The legal charges against uh, Mr. Obama, the U.S. president, alleges that he has committed crimes against humanity for his support of the Muslim Brotherhood, which has been declared a terrorist organization in Egypt. Half-brother Malik Obama is employed as the executive secretary of the Islamic Dawah organization. The IDO was established by the Sudanese government, and the U.S. State Department has officially branded Sudan as a state sponsor of terrorism. Sudan's president is Omar al-Bashir, who is wanted by the International Criminal Court on seven counts relating to crimes against humanity. Al-Bashir is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. The purpose of Malik Obama's IDO is to spread radical Wahhabist Islamic ideology across the African continent. Malik Obama controls the purse strings of the organization's money used to advance jihadist Islam in Africa. The legal charges against the Obama brothers was brought to the International Criminal Court by Egyptian law professor Dr. Nabil Medhat Salim, a member of the Egyptian Bar Association. The charges allege that Barack Obama and Brother Malik aided the Muslim Brotherhood takeover of Egypt, which resulted in the deaths of thousands of people, the burning of Coptic churches, and rape and destruction. The Egyptian lawyers accused Barack Obama of teaming up with the Muslim Brotherhood before and after the revolution, and that President Obama supplied weapons and ammo to the Muslim Brotherhood-controlled government of Mohammed Morsi, which were used to kill Egyptian citizens. The charges filed at the International Criminal Court alleged that Barack Obama, quote, cooperated incited and assisted the armed elements of the Muslim Brotherhood in the commission of crimes against humanity in the period from 3-7-2013 to 8-18-2013 in the Arab Republic of Egypt. The complaint against Barack Obama and the Muslim Brotherhood claims that Egyptian Christians were subjected to persecution, including death, torture, and the plundering and burning of 85 churches. The document mentions the death of a 10-year-old Egyptian girl who was shot and killed as she walked to a Bible class. It mentions a young Coptic priest who was tortured to death and the murder of two girls, Christian girls, who were riddled with bullets as they attended a Christian wedding. Here in the United States, we see more evidence of Muslim Obama's ongoing persecution of Christians in the U.S. Armed Forces. Two Baptist military chaplains have accused the Department of Veteran Affairs of forcing them out of a chaplain training program after they refused orders to stop quoting the Bible and praying in the name of Jesus Christ. The Conservative Baptist Association of America is suing the department and Secretary Eric Shinseki. The chaplains allege that they were subjected to ridicule and harassment that led to one chaplain quitting the program and the other chaplain being removed from the program. 
Navy Chaplain Lieutenant Commander Dan Klinder and retired Army Chaplain Major Stephen Furtko were enrolled in the Veterans Affairs Department of Defense Clinical Pastoral Education Center program in San Diego. It was led by a VA employee described as openly hostile toward Christianity. The lawsuit alleges that the program director said that VA policy prohibits chaplains from praying in the name of Jesus and that she reportedly warned the chaplains not to quote biblical scriptures in her classroom, that she mocked their views about good and evil in the world and said that anybody who believes that Jesus Christ is the only way to God has no place in the program. Now, in North Korea, another communist government, the communists reportedly executed 80 people in seven cities for offenses ranging from possession of a holy Bible to watching South Korean television programs. The executions were held in public arenas. Thousands of people were compelled to watch the victims being killed by executioners firing machine guns. The Stuxnet computer malware has seriously infected the internal network of a Russian nuclear power plant. It is the same computer worm that caused chaos in Iran's uranium facilities in the Tons. No country has claimed responsibility for developing Stuxnet, but it's believed that it was developed by American and Israeli intelligence agencies. The revelation about the Russian nuclear plant's infection was made by Eugene Kaspersky, founder of antivirus software company Kaspersky Labs, and first reported by Australians by Australia's SC Magazine. He was speaking at a conference in Canberra. Mr. Kaspersky said he was tipped off about the infection of the Russian nuclear plant by a technician at the facility. The technician disclosed that the virus was carried to the Russian plant on a USB thumb drive. Mr. Kaspersky also disclosed that Stuxnet has infected the International Space Station. Problems are mounting for Obamacare. The White House and Department of Health and Human Services are not responding to reports that fewer than 50,000 Americans have purchased a health care plan on the troubled healthcare.gov website, making it even worse. uh, Bill Clinton has chastised Barack Obama, telling him that he's obligated to keep his word. And uh, one Democratic congressman, Kurt Schrader, has accused Mr. Obama of grossly misleading the American people. I'm Rick Wiles. We're going to take a break. I'll be back in a minute with my guest. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. Let us praise our God together. Listen to the Bible from Zephaniah 3. Sing. O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. Lord, the King of Israel is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. From Zephaniah 3, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. Hear more at radiobible.org. That's radiobible.org. This is True News. We report the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Various U.S. presidents are marked forever by statements that they made. Richard Nixon's famous line was, I'm not a crook. George Herbert Walker Bush will will be remembered for saying, read my lips, no new taxes. Bill Clinton will be forever remembered for the line, I did not have sex with that woman. And what about Barack Obama? Well, no doubt it will be the line. If you like that plan, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Well, former President Bill Clinton admonished President Obama today that he is obligated to fulfill his commitment to the American people. So you know things are getting really bad for you when Slick Willie lectures you about keeping your word. 
The problem for Obamacare is that they can't keep their word. The scheme requires forcing insurers to cancel tens of millions of existing policies. In seven weeks, Obamacare is mandatory for all Americans. The IRS is empowered to levy fines uh, for those who do not comply. Uh, despite the fact that the $700 million healthcare.gov website doesn't work. Furthermore, there are many religious organizations such as hospitals, food banks, children's homes that will shut their doors rather than comply with Obamacare mandates. Religious retailer Hobby Lobby is prepared to shut down all of their stores if they lose their Supreme Court case. And uh, let's not forget that millions of Americans will see their work hours reduced to 29 hours, thanks to Obamacare. Well, the whole thing's a colossal mess, but Mr. Obama shows no signs of humbling himself by admitting he's in over his head. With seven weeks remaining to fix the website, how will the IT experts do it? Can it be done? And what are the security risks for people who submit private data on the site? Mr. John McAvee, founder of computer antivirus company McAvee Associates, is on the telephone to help us understand the scale of the government's problems with Obamacare. I also want to ask him a lot of questions about other cyber issues. Uh, Mr. McAfee, welcome to True News. Well, thank you, Rick. I'm very happy to be here. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, um, let's just start with with the website. Um, you know, in private in private industry, if 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 a company spent seven hundred million dollars on a website that didn't work. Um, somebody would be out the door really fast. Uh, that's not going to happen here with the government. They've got seven weeks to get it together. Uh, can it be done? Can can, it, can something this size be fixed in seven weeks? Well, you know, absolutely not fixed. It can be polished in seven weeks. Uh, they can they can get the system into uh, enough condition that people will be able to log on and register. However. Uh, it's, it's, it boils down to a bad architecture. What they're trying to do is, is they created, let's say, a house made out of, uh, of rice paper, and they're trying to put a steel door on the front door. Uh, they can put that steel door on, but that's not going to make any difference. You know, a, a, a spoon will be able to cut through the rice paper and get in, and it's the same thing electronically. Uh, without changing the architecture, which means throwing it away and starting over, the system will be so full of holes that that uh, only a madman would use it. But we're going to be required by the government to use it. There are tens of millions of people that will will have to use it, or the IRS is going to come after them. So you're telling me that uh, they're going to submit private, confidential uh, medical information online and financial information on a government website that's not secure. Oh, well, you know, I'm not. Uh, they can come after me if they wish. Uh, I value my privacy. And and by, by putting the information in that they are requesting, I might as well mail every hacker in the world and say, here is my Social Security number, my birth date, my passwords, uh, and every information, every piece of information that you need to empty my bank account. Uh, and to save you the trouble, I've signed some blank checks, and here they are. I mean, I might as well do that. I'm not going to do that. Now, several weeks ago, it was revealed, um, you know, that in the fine print, the website says that you have no right to privacy. But you pointed out in another interview that it doesn't matter if, what they say uh, if, if, if the government uh, says, well, we're going to remove that, that language. It really doesn't matter because, as you pointed out, there are a lot of government agencies that are already empowered to access that data. Well, it's, it's a thing called FISMA, F-I-S-M-A, the Federal Information Security Management Act, which requires all government agencies to alert the people that if you submit any data on a government uh, server, the government has full right to access that data and give it to whoever they want for whatever purpose they want. And this came, this came out of the, the original um, Patriot Act. And keep in mind, the Patriot Act was the... Uh, 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 procedures and, 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 and processes to allow us to intercept uh, uh, terrorist communications. And so they, they don't know they were terrorists, but they can, they can at any time evoke that act and say, well, we want to look at what, you, what you're doing just to make sure. And then we can pass that information to anybody we want. So uh, they, they take the language out, they can keep it in, it makes no difference. The law requires that the government alert us that they will use our data any way they see fit. 
Okay, we're going into the holiday season, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Realistically, <coughs> what do you expect that will happen with Obamacare, the, the healthcare dot the dot healthcare dot gov website by January? Realistically, what do you think is going to be happening with it? I think that they will fix the bottlenecks to allow uh, larger numbers of people to register uh, and and submit their information. But the security holes will merely increase. Any change that you make, it's like, you know, so they're putting a steel door on the front of a paper house. Mm -hmm. uh, that's merely, that merely weakens the front of the paper, which you could have walked through anyway. It's just making it worse from a security standpoint. Again, I'm only talking from a security standpoint. That's, right. that's my issue. That's my, that's my interest and uh, that's my expertise. <laughs> Um, and so from a security standpoint, it's going to be more of a nightmare. It may look very nice on the surface, very polished, very smooth, very pretty. And people go, oh, that's great. It's fixed. No, it's not fixed. It's made worse. Uh, on another issue, uh, Eugene Kapersky revealed at a conference in Canberra, Australia, that oh. Stuxnet has infected a Russian nuclear power plant and the International Space Station. Um, well, well, that's absolutely true. Um, the, the, we're in the world of cyber warfare. In fact, we might as well stop calling it anything but cyber warfare. If you have any wars at all, it will be cyber warfare. Keep in mind, we're in an era where our guns uh, are controlled by computers, uh, where uh, our tanks are controlled by computers. Certainly our bombs are controlled by computers. Our power structures are composed, by computer, are, are, are composed of computers. So, so basically, the person that controls the computer controls the weapon. And, and, the, and it's so easy to get into these systems. Here's what's happened. We have, our technology has advanced so rapidly that we have created systems that could be turned against us with a snap of a finger. By, by a child almost. Anybody who wants to, to dig into the, the ins and outs of, of security software could figure out how to, to tap into any system that we have, whether it be a nuclear power plant or a, a smart bomb. Um, so our security has not kept up with, with other advances. And, and Eugene is correct. Uh, the, they did get into the, uh, to the uh, power station, and it is on the space station. And it was not done maliciously by the people who are working for the power station or who, are, who inhabit the space station. It is done by a thing called human engineering, where we, where we watch people and, and see how they behave. Are they curious? Are they not curious? Uh, do they cheat on their wives? And after a few weeks of watching, we know exactly what to do to get that person to take something in for us, unbeknownst to that person. And it's usually done on a thumb drive or some other USB device that, that they have no knowledge of, of it containing malware. How dangerous is Duxnet? Potentially, what could happen? <laughs> I wouldn't worry. I'm sorry to laugh, but I wouldn't worry about Stuxnet. There, there are thousands of people who are doing similar things now. The Chinese, in fact, you know, the Chinese are so laissez-faire about their their cyber warfare. They don't even bother to hide who it is that wrote the program or where it came from. You know, they have that much arrogance, and they have a great deal of tech, of tech, uh, technology. Now, I know that Eugene Kapersky believes that the Russians have the highest uh, uh, technology, and that, that might be because he is Russian himself. However, I firmly believe that the Chinese have a far greater understanding of this area and a far greater penetration. And it's the Chinese I would be watching. But no, it's, it's, it's dirt simple, sir. John, I started this radio program in the late 1990s, and you know that was a time of uh, Y2K. And I still remember a statement that former CIA Director George Tenet made in testimony to Congress regarding Y2K. And it stuck in my mind because he said that um, of you know the tens of thousands of, of IT specialists who were uh, brought into the United States from India and Pakistan and Arab countries and many countries around the world, that no background checks had been done on these people. And and I remember thinking then, well, th this is insane. How do we know uh, that that some country did not send in thousands of IT people, um, you know, for the purpose of planting something on 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 major U.S. Uh, infrastructure that would that would be timed released, you know, ten, fifteen years later. Is is there any possibility that happened? 
Well, well certainly it's, it's possible, but it would not be necessary for that to happen. Let, let me tell you, give you a simple example of how uh, malware is planted within top secret organizations. Let's assume that you work for the NSA or, or for a nuclear power plant. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me ask you, what are your interests in life? Right? What, what, what interests you? What hobbies, for example? Oh, um, you know, hiking, um, outdoors, you know, things like that. Okay. Okay, so now, well, let's say that, that I take a, 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 a thumb drive, okay, and, and I lay it outside your car when you've parked and you've gone hiking, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and, when it comes, when, and when you come back, you, you pick it up because it's red and you're curious and you, look, you turn it over and on the back is a label that says, uh, beautiful photographs of Pikes Peak area, you know, uh, or an unseen part of the National Forest that you've never seen but you would like to have gone to. It's likely that you're going to take that home and drop it in your computer and look at the pictures. What if we wait until you're at work and we plant it in the parking lot uh, when you're coming back from lunch? You might be likely to take it in and put it on your work system just to see what, what these pictures are. And we will put those beautiful pictures in there. We're also going to put a program that, as soon as you plug it in, runs on your system and moves to every other system within that facility. It is dirt simple. Mm-hmm. We don't need to, to have people from China or from Russia come here uh, and, and train for years to try to get into that secret security system. No. We do. We let you do it for us. You know, if, if the story is true, uh, the, you know, they were handing out uh, thumb drives at, at the G20 summit meeting in St. Petersburg, compliments of Vladimir Putin. And uh, right. supposedly well, no, a no number idiot. of diplomats it, received them. Right, of course. And, and they're not, they have not been trained enough to know that they should immediately throw it in the garbage and wash their hands just in case. Seriously, this is the problem. We think that we will solve our security issues by high-tech measures. Well, we cannot if we do not also solve the human engineering issue by training our diplomats and training our staff within top-secret facilities the, the techniques of avoiding being humanly engineered by the opposition. Mm-hmm. This is the fundamental problem. You this know, is our weakness, and and this is how people get in. I, and, and and I can you know I can say this uh, you know as a radio host, people people mail thumb drives to me. Rick, check this yes. out. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I, that that right. thumb drive's going well, in the trash. I don't care if it came from my grandmother's well, going into the trash can. Of course. In fact, burn them because you don't know that it came from your grandmother. Anybody can write your grandmother's return address. So you have no clue. That's right. So throw these things away. Never accept any electronic media from anyone under any circumstances, period. And yet we do it at will. We do it with, with glee. This is our craziness. We spend tens of millions of dollars on security programs, then we just pick up a, a, a thumb drive and go, oh, wow, I've been looking for something like this, and we plug it in. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Grid X2 starts tomorrow in the United States. A number of of electrical uh, service utilities uh, plus FEMA and the FBI and uh, a lot of federal agencies, including uh, Canada and Mexico, are participating in in this uh, scenario for a major cyber attack on the electrical grid system. Uh, How vulnerable is is the electrical grid system? It's as vulnerable as any system to the to the the human frailties of the people who who staff these systems or who staff these these facilities. As I said, I can guarantee that they're not looking at the human side of the equation. They're looking at okay, can I hack into this this uh, this enormously secure facility? Well, probably not. But can I get someone working there to to do it for me? Absolutely, yes. And here's the problem. No one is addressing the human aspect, and it is the human aspect that, that causes our grave holes. Now, there are major exceptions. Obamacare, for example, you don't need human engineering there. Anybody can get in technically because they have architected it improperly. Um, so in that case, I wouldn't have to worry about dropping a thumb drive in front of uh, someone working in one of the exchanges. I just pack in myself, as anybody can. The, the next world war is it going to start with uh, with a major cyber attack? Lights out, everything goes dark. Yes, I anticipate the next world war. The 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 people who are the aggressors will be sitting at home in armchairs while their software turns our weapons against ourselves. Now that's a scary thought. What you just said, while they turn no, it, our weapons against ourselves. 
Yes, yes, this is the thing. That I'm saying that cyber warfare is no longer a warfare, a war that involves soldiers and people in the field uh, and men manning airplanes. No, it's, it's going to be done by very brilliant technicians and very brilliant human engineers that plant the appropriate software and software being designed by those brilliant technicians, and at the switch of a, switch of a button, the uh, 50 caliber machine gun that, that's, that's uh, automatically controlled. And by the way, these 50 caliber guns are being sold in Texas to the general public now uh, for deer hunting and other things. I, I've seen videos of them. It's you know, spectacular. You don't have to touch the gun. It finds the target, aims and fires, and never misses. And, so, and this is also computer-controlled. So everything, all of our guns, our bombs, believe me, they will be turned against us. This is how it's going to happen. And call me crazy. Everybody does anyway. But this is it. This is how it's going to happen. Um, let's talk about the NSA. Um, unless you're living under a rock, uh, you're not paying attention to what's happening, uh, it's obvious uh, that there is no privacy left in the world anywhere. Uh, the numbers that we've seen published uh, in The Guardian and other publications uh, indicating that something like 130 billion telephone calls per month being monitored by the NSA. Um, is, is, this, is this our future? Is there any chance we're ever going to see privacy again, or, or have we lost it forever? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, unbelievably sad if we have lost it forever. Because without our privacy, what are we? If, if we can't have the 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 privacy to talk to our, our sons and daughters about the facts of life and about issues of, of, of depth without people listening to us, when we can't have, uh, have communion with our spouses without someone watching, uh, when we can't have a private moment anywhere without people seeing, looking, hearing, and judging. No, we, we can't live that way. This cannot be the way. I mean, I think that George Orwell's 1984 showed us what a horror that would be, and a horror it would be. We have to do something, sir. We can't just sit back and say, oh, Jesus, this is happening, and throw up our hands. We, we elected this government. Uh, we did not elect a, a government to spy on us or to tell us what to do or how to do it. I, I think that when Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and John, Thomas Jefferson sat down, they envisioned a government that would build our roads and staff our schools and, and create communication systems and be of service to us rather than we being the children that they monitor and control. I don't like being in kindergarten. And, and with with the power that they have through the technology right now, the danger is there there will not be any uh, opposition form because they will know who is who is organizing to bring down their their power structure. Allegedly, we still have a constitution and we still have a judiciary and we still have a government which functions no matter how strangely or insanely. We voted these people in, all of us. We can vote them out. And, and, and you're not going to find a, a replacement within the current party system, I can assure you, because the, the, the power structure is so ingrained. We have the power to change this. Do we have the courage? I don't know. I do. Do you? I, absolutely, and I've you know, and I've been I've been warning about this day for fifteen years on the radio, and um, uh, and now it's here, and and I'm finding so many people willing to accept it. Like you tell them what the government is doing, and they just yawn, and it, they don't care. That's what troubles well, me. I mean, I think I think they will care when when someone breaks through their door and says. Listen, the discussion you just had with your son about whatever is, is not politically acceptable, and we're going to take you off for retraining. At that point, I believe you will care. I agree. But that's going to be too late. That's going to be way too late. Uh, right now, we have the opportunity. Right now, we have the power. And right now, if we had the will, you and I and every other citizen in this country could change this country. Do we have the will? That's the issue. That's one, the issue. one last question. Uh, you're planning to launch a product called Decentral. What is it? It's well. It's a. It is a device that communicates with your smartphone. It's just a piece of hardware. Has no screen or, or keyboard. It has an on-off switch. When you turn it on, it creates a private 
an invisible network that if you if you can still surf the, the web on your phone and get whatever data you want, you can find out what, what time the restaurants open and close. But if you want to send a private communication, you use the private network. It cannot be monitored. It cannot even be seen. John, what happens when... Um when the uh, the government thugs show up and say, "John, you're going to um, you're going to alter this device for us." Well, you know, I I, I think that they'll probably end up in federal prison, um, or or <laughs> I will I will leave the country. I'm not sure. Uh, at some point, someone's got to stand up. I'm I'm 68 years old, so it's not like I have a lot of time left to be concerned about. So so maybe I can be just a little more arrogant and a little more. Um, a little more uh, uncautious than the average American. But, but you know, I, I will not bow to it. I'm glad to hear that. We need more people with this attitude. My guest, uh, John McAfee, founder of uh, McAfee Associates. John, thank you. Appreciate you taking time to be with us today. You're welcome, sir. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement. Do you need to hear from God? He will speak to the spirit of anyone who honestly seeks Him. Here's today's moment with Charles Stanley. And I can remember on one occasion, and I was just going through a real difficult time and asking God, why don't you let's get on with this, just like all of us do at time we get impatient. And I remember kneeling there and just struggling and weeping a little bit. And you know how God speaks to you. I know how He speaks to me. Could not have made this any clearer. It's like he whispered to me, you can trust perfect love. All of a sudden, for me personally, I knew that this God who loved me was saying, my love for you is such, it is trustworthy in any and every given situation in your life. What you are going through, you can trust that I am loving you through this no matter what you feel. Perfect love is trustworthy. You can trust God's perfect love to forgive your sin and give you a home in heaven. Learn about the salvation only God can provide when you click All Things Are New at InTouch.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. I'm going to tell you two true stories about real events in two separate socialist dictatorships. And you tell me the name of the socialist dictatorship where each event happened. Okay, story number one. In socialist dictatorship number one, the currency is being debased by the government. Economists are expecting a devaluation of the currency in the near future and the onset of hyperinflation. The socialist dictator's popularity is sinking as people become increasingly frustrated with the failure of his socialist policies and runaway corruption in the government. In an attempt to turn the tide, the socialist dictator ordered military troops to seize the country's biggest retail store chain. The chain is the equivalent of Best Buy in the USA. Troops moved in and seized all of the company's stores and slashed prices on all the electronics on the store shelves. Jubilant shoppers lined up for hours to carry off TV screens, computers, washers, dryers, appliances at major discounted prices. Compliments of the socialist dictator and the military. Now, in socialist dictatorship number two, heavily armed police raided the home of an investigative news journalist who was uncovering corruption in the government. The reporter's private notes were seized. The raid on the reporter's home was carried off under the guise of an investigation into her husband based on charges he faced in the 1980s. Name the two socialist dictatorships. Well, if you guessed Venezuela for socialist dictatorship number one, you're correct. Socialist dictatorship number two is the United States of America. The raid on the reporter's home happened recently in the state of of Maryland, the uh, colonial state that originally was known as the Free State. 
Washington Times reporter Mr. Guy Taylor is on the telephone to give us the details about this very troubling event in Maryland. He is the State Department correspondent for the Washington Times. Mr. Taylor, welcome to True News. Uh, hi, Rick. How are you? I'm doing fine. I appreciate you taking time from your schedule. You're in, you're at Capitol Hill right now, and and uh, we want to hear from somebody inside the Times uh, the the real story about what happened because. This sounds like this sounds like a story out of a dictatorship out of Central America or South America or or, or or Caribbean island. But this happened to a reporter in the state of Maryland who works for your paper, The Washington Times. So give us right. a t- yeah. uh, well the, the uh, let me just start with this Rick. Um the reporter's name is Audrey Hudson. A uh, couple of facts I think we should probably throw out uh, so we can steer the conversation uh, in the way I think it should go. One is that this uh, reporting at question that Audrey Hudson had done for the Washington Times uh, was actually reporting that she did during the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, and she was pointing out uh, it was a very specific series of stories that she'd done and one in particular where she pointed out that uh, federal agents working for this relatively new at the time, uh, 2006, um, a program of uh, federal air marshals. And this is where the under the Department of Homeland Security, which, as you know, was created after uh, it's sort of deck chair rearranging after 9-11 by the Bush administration. Within Homeland Security, there's this uh, this federal air marshals program, which for anybody who, who doesn't know, is the program that, that puts um, uh, clandestinely puts, um, uh, you know, commonly dressed uh, armed federal agents on commercial flights to monitor uh, whether or not there might be hijackers on the plane. And uh, the story that Ms. Hudson had written was actually about how agents testifying, or officials from the, the Federal Air Marshal Service testifying before Congress about the scope of their program were actually fudging the numbers and uh, essentially lying to Congress, saying that the program was bigger than it actually was and that they were able to field uh, undercover agents onto more commercial flights than uh, they actually were doing. And you can imagine, if you pick that apart, why that's a fairly incendiary uh, thing to write, particularly if it's true, because uh, it would suggest that commercial flights in the years after 9-11 were actually not as safe as this federal agency that had been created by this massive deck chair rearranging was saying that, uh, that, that they were. So... Years go by, Ms. Hudson has gone on, she's written for a variety of other publications. The Washington Times has those stories archived on its website. And uh, now recently, this past summer, uh, there was a search on Ms. Hudson's house. And I'll get into specifically what made the search come about based on my reporting and talking to uh, Audrey, the reporter, and her husband. But during the search... There were federal. There was a federal agent there from the U.S. Coast Guard Service who formerly had been working at the Air Marshal Service when Miss Hudson wrote these stories, and he began asking her questions about, you know, was she the same Audrey Hudson as uh, as the reporter from the Washington Times who used to write those those uh, Air Marshal stories? And she had responded yes. And, and during the search. Uh, Afterwards, it occurred to Ms. Hudson, some, about a month afterwards, that during the search, the, the Maryland State Police and the federal agents actually combed through her private office and uh, dug out a very specific little cache of old files that referred to uh, some sensitive material relating to those uh, those stories. I mean, it looked like they were on some kind of a hunt to find out who the sources for those stories had been. Uh, this has now played out. Uh, it, it, we're in a situation where there's potential pending legal from both uh, legal movements from both sides. But let me give a little bit more context now. So, why were the police there to begin with? What happened was Miss Hus- uh, Hudson's husband, who is a U.S. Coast Guard uh, employee and works with ordinance and 
and whatnot, uh, had somehow been red flagged at some point by most likely the ATF, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, because of uh, an Internet purchase. Whether It's not clear when you dig into this, and I encourage people to go read the, the story, and hopefully you'll link to it. But it's not clear. At some point he became flagged so that the ATF alerted the, the basically the Internal Affairs Division of the U.S. Coast Guard and this U.S. Coast Guard investigator to go in and take a look at this employee and make sure you know there's a proper background check and whatnot. Uh, so the Coast Guard uh, investigator starts this investigation and finds out that in fact Miss Hudson's husband has uh, uh, a rap sheet that's pretty old that involves. Um, you know, having been in possession of a firearm uh, when he was in his early 20s, didn't have the right paperwork for it, had uh, an arrest on there. And in the state of Maryland, um, like a handful of states around the country, it kind of goes state to state. Uh, some states are, are, are more uh, libertarian with their gun laws. In Maryland it happens to be one where if you have a, a federal conviction in the past, you uh, you can't legally possess firearms if that uh, conviction was related to firearms in the past. So so this Coast Guard investigator puts together uh, suddenly like this case where he begins um, sort of shopping around to Maryland State Police and saying, well, this is a Maryland State law. Uh, I'm going to request that Maryland State Police collude with me. We'll get a, a le- legitimate search warrant to go into this guy's home and see if he's got any illegal firearms. Part of this Coast Guard investigator's uh, initial probe prior to the search warrant involves you know, scanning digital media, social media, web, found some stuff on Facebook that looked like it was a reference by the reporter's husband to a gun ownership use that basically as probable cause, as well as this earlier ATF flagging of, now this is where it gets kind of over the top, but supposedly this uh, the gentleman had, uh, the reporter's husband had at some point bought what's called a potato gun uh, via the Internet from a company in Europe, particularly in Sweden. Apparently there's, there's some kind of case file or something where the ATF it has a watch on these types of transactions because uh, their belief, and this is stated in the search warrant, that potato gun is actually code language for silencers for large uh, weapon uh, guns. So all of this goes into the search warrant. Maryland State Police are able to actually get a federal judge to sign off on the search warrant. Lo and behold, middle of the night, um, the, uh, the group of Maryland State Police and this Coast Guard agent, who is the same one that I mentioned before, who began asking the reporter questions during the search, go in. They find a few uh, handguns, uh, smaller arms, none of which have no charges have ever come of this. However, during the search, that's when they began combing through the reporter's uh, private office and found this stuff. About a month after the search, uh, out of the blue, the, the still no charges filed, the Coast Guard investigator phones up the reporter's husband and says, hey, there's a package of stuff that we uh, got during the search that we uh, got to get back to you. Uh, at this point, the reporter and her husband are thinking, you know, well, what the heck, heck is this? And they get the package back, and, and lo and behold, it is these files that have to do with sensitive reporting records from her work uh, doing these air marshal stories. So that's pretty much the thick and thin of it, as objectively as I can tell it, without uh, sort of taking the bait of of trying to lean one way or another on this story. Mm-hmm. I, I appreciate that, Guy. Uh, so... Um do you think do you think that they were that that the entire raid was a cover to to get into Mrs. Uh, Hudson's? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it certainly carries the appearance of that. My own judgment on it, uh, Rick, is that within the the multitude of federal agencies and federal law enforcement agencies, uh, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. Uh, you're going to have periods where there are individuals who will engage in this type of activity. It's part of having a huge government, and when uh, and so that's it's possible that this thing started out as a simple investigation into 
uh, the reporter's husband and, and somehow escalated into targeting uh, specific files in her home. It would certainly feel that way, and that would... But that, you know, that narrative falls in line with a variety of other instances. And, and where I think the Obama administration comes into it is that one of the things that uh, President Obama really pushed for during his first term was this kind of um, this nebulous sort of war on leaks, this idea that uh, his administration was going to take uh, leaks of classified information to journalists far more seriously uh, than the uh, Bush administration had, even though there were a couple of really high-profile leak cases during the Bush years, and that, you know, under that type of rhetoric from uh, the center, the, the head of the administration, the president himself, that, that people in these agencies who might think that this was somehow uh, the type of behavior that would be acceptable in a free society with a, a very aggressive and full-throttled free press, they... they feel like they have a little more wiggle room, and we start to have instances like this. In that respect, I think, I know you're going to have uh, uh, listeners um, who are uh, going to um, share the comment and say, well, you know, this is outrageous, but just from where I sit, being a, they're trying to be an objective uh, look at it, my own personal take is that this, um, this the, the big question, which will probably not come out until there's further legal uh, back and forth between the journalists, the Washington Times, and the U.S. Coast Guard in the state of Maryland, is at what point did the Coast Guard agent become aware that his uh, probe into this uh, kind of vague gun charge of, of this uh, journalist's husband, at what point did he become aware that, that she, the journalist, was actually part of uh, the, the investigation? At some point, he realized that their house was a fairly target-rich uh, uh, place. And, and so was that, how early in the probe was that? Was it, and was it something that there was anyone else at the U.S. Coast Guard or the ATF or the Air Marshal Service where this Coast Guard investigator previously worked? Is it something that he had shared with other people or possibly even taken orders from anyone from? So when you really get into, like, the nitty-gritty on these things, where the rubber actually meets the road, that those are the kind of questions that will come up. Yes, but when you put this together with, with other things, such as the Justice Department spying on the Associated Press and and, and, yeah. and the NSA, uh, you know, gathering massive amounts of information on phone calls and electronic communications— when you start putting it all together, it becomes a chilling picture. Uh, it really does, particularly because the last time that this became a, a mainstream topic of conversation in this country was during the Watergate era, during the Nixon era, and, and it was like we moved way past that as a society and a news media, and to somehow feel like the tables have all turned and there's now a, a alternative leadership in the White House and this is happening again is really disconcerting. But I also think that the the uh, New York Times case is, is one that has gotten a lot of main, more mainstream media has really gotten into it. Uh, a reporter named James Risen who'd written a book where he has never named any of the sources. However, the CIA decided that uh, one of the main sources in the book, and this had to do with the Clinton administration's policy toward Iran, that one of these sources had leaked classified information. That that CIA agent is in jail at this point. He's been charged, and, that, and this reporter, James Risen, is running around trying to protect uh, and say that he didn't have to give up his source. And what's come out during that case is that it's it's not really clear from a, a purely legal standpoint whether or not the U.S. Constitution protects journalists from uh, revealing their sources. And so I think that case is probably going to go to the Supreme Court in, in the coming year, and we're going to hear more about about that. Uh, but sorry, go ahead. Right, and and then you have the, the the mysterious death of Michael Hastings several months ago. Right. Well, that's another, uh, you know, certainly um, a, a, the piece of cheese for the the conspiracy theory ants to climb all over. I, I feel horrible about that, and I, I don't. I'm not up to speed exactly on the minutia of the investigation mm -hmm. into that the way I am with this, but. You know, you, you have any time you have an example in the United States where uh, I mean, there also was a Fox News journalist. I know I've said James 
uh, rise in a minute ago. There's a Fox News journalist named James Rosen who uh, it was revealed that the FBI had been tracking his movements in and out of the State Department involving a leak case uh, that had to do with some documents pertaining to North Korea uh, about a year and a half ago. So that, and that case kind of blew into the open before, last spring. Uh, there's a number of these cases around. So I, I think really... To give you just, I'm in, in Washington, the sort of Washington mentality on this. And I know you're going to have listeners who think, okay, now it's time to turn my ears off because those people don't know anything. The sort of Washington perspective on this is that is, is that will the Supreme Court uh, weigh in on this in, in such a way that, that clarifies whether or not uh, journalists are, are truly protected under the U.S. Constitution? And, and you got you got Senator Feinstein who wants to. He, she wants Congress to pass a bill defining who and what is a journalist. Yeah, that's another thing. That's going to be tricky because with the sort of digital revolution of the last uh, 20 years, you've got all kinds of new sources out there that... Um, well, under the, Feinst- water, under, yeah. under the Feinstein rule, uh, I wouldn't be a journalist, even though I've been on the air right. 15 years and and we, we, we have reported a lot of major stories, but I wouldn't fall under her guidelines. So right. I would be subject to to who knows what under her regime. Uh, last question, Guy. Uh, when, among your peers in Washington, when, you're, when you get together uh, after work and you're just talking with other reporters, what is the general atmosphere among reporters right now? Is there a chill? Uh, is there a chill? Absolutely, yeah, there is. I mean, it's a difficult town to work in. I think the Obama administration does have a reputation for being a little bit more standoffish uh, towards the media, When it, and, and part of this has to do with this so-called war on leaks. And I, I just want to make sure, and that's not just like, oh, yeah, they're feeding everything to the New York Times and being difficult to everybody else. This is something that... that goes for everybody, whether you're perceived to be right-wing media, left-wing media, centrist. I mean, it's just we're, we're living in a time here where there's uh, this administration has, has really clamp, clamped down. And, and so, yeah, there's, there is, it's not a sense of fear. It's more a sense of frustration that uh, this, the government these days doesn't really see journalists as a way to tell the government's story. I think, you know, just a kind of roundabout point on that, you know, had the Obama administration seen traditional journalists as a good way to tell a story, then the administration might have done a better job telling, you know, selling its uh, um, uh, Affordable Care Act bill, and, and that hasn't happened, because trying even just to get basic information about the program has been difficult when you come up against standoffish uh, government officials. Now, you can imagine that that standoffishness is exacerbated and escalated when you start talking about national security matters, such as how many uh, uh, undercover agents there are guarding against suspected terrorists on commercial flights. And anything can be classified today as national security or a, a terrorist-related uh, activity, and and then, you know, the full weight of the U.S. government comes down on you because of it. Now, ironically, Guy, uh, Israel is furious with the Obama administration. They have been for quite some time because a, a number of, of very sensitive issues regarding Israel have been deliberately leaked by the Obama administration, and they don't seem to be worried about the fact that they're leaking information that that uh, harms Israel's national interests. So, now it's certainly been interesting to watch that play out uh, during the Obama years. I mean, I, I think you know it's funny though. I, I think there's two sides to that too. I, I read a piece this morning in Haaretz, the one of the uh, Israeli uh, dailies, that talked about how. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of frustration inside Israel towards the Netanyahu government for uh, not, you know not being open to the possibility of a peaceful talks uh, with uh, either the Palestinians or the Iranians. But I, I definitely think that uh, it, you know you've got to remember with with Barack Obama's relationship with Israel that like now you've got John Kerry running in the middle and Kerry's relationships, you know, while he's definitely a solid member of the traditional uh, um, left camp, I mean, John Kerry's relationships with individuals in power in the Middle East 
go back quite a bit farther than uh, even George W. Bush's. So you know, let alone Bar- Barack Obama. So that that kind of throws a an interesting uh, iron into the whole thing. I mean, and you also I think you got to remember that the U.S. Uh, Israeli relationship is, has kind of done a lot of twists and turns, but it, it's never quite. Uh, emerged from the Iran Contra when the United States was colluding with both Tehran and Israel to try and pursue a very dubious uh, foreign policy in Latin America. So there's a lot of a lot of pieces to that whole thing, um, it, but it's definitely. You know, I think it was. It, you you have to look at the fact also that BB Benjamin Netanyahu came to Washington. When he comes here, he bows down and goes to the White House and shows the same respect to the leader of the free world that, that any any Israeli uh, prime minister has done for any other U.S. president. But there's definitely some tension there. I don't know that there's an exception at play that that the Obama administration is uh, carefully and strategically leaking. Uh, some stories, not others, but I think we have to ask that question seriously and keep a close eye on it. Hey, one more last question. Do you Have you heard anything about, you know, there are reports coming out of Egypt that a group of Egyptian lawyers filed criminal charges in the International Criminal Court against Barack Obama and his half-brother Malik for uh, their association with the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. Have you heard anything I about those heard charges? About that at all. I, you know, uh, when I hear that stuff, I think you gotta you gotta realize that um, you know the United States is pursuing a lot of policies, very realistic policies in the Middle East that uh, anger mm-hmm. uh, certain segments of the population there, and and and. But, the but Malik, administration has continued pursuing those policies. Mm-hmm. So. But Malik, Malik, his half brother, is on the is actually on the payroll of the Muslim Brotherhood in Sudan. And okay. yeah, so you, you got these do- documents. That yeah, that? yeah, yeah. You can check it out. Uh, check out uh, Raymond Ibrahim. It's, it's it's reported quite extensively in the Egyptian. Uh, news, but uh, I was just wondering there at the State Department whether you've heard anything about these criminal charges. I appreciate you uh, taking time. I'm going to let you go because I know you're, you're, you've got to get back to work. Uh, uh, my guest, uh, Mr. Guy Taylor, he's the State Department correspondent for the Washington Times. Thank you, Guy. Rick, thanks for having me. Happy to do it anytime. Well, once again, True News has delivered a very unique newscast to the body of Jesus Christ. You heard information tonight that is suppressed by the establishment-controlled news media. Now, it's important that you understand that True News has a small staff and a small budget, and we go up every day against the mainstream news media that has billions of dollars and thousands of employees to deceive you, not to inform you, but to deceive you. Sadly, the vast majority of Christians are clueless about what is happening in the world around them. My job is not to wake them up. My job is to keep you awake. I am your no-dose pill dispensed by heaven to keep the end-time church wide awake through very perilous times. Now, we operate this ministry on faith. We do not have any organized fundraising operation. We do our job as faithfully as possible while trusting that our Heavenly Father will supply all our needs. And He has done so for 15 years. We urgently need reinforcements from the end-time army of saints to stand with us. Would you consider joining the fight to keep True News going strong to hold up our arms so that we do not become weary, please consider becoming a regular recurring monthly partner with True News. Click on truenews.com, go to support, and make the most generous donation possible. Thank you.